welcome everyone to a new Nomadic Labs uh, research seminar. So today we welcome Pierre Genves to talk about information extraction from graphs, and he's going to present the test query tool. Pierre Genves is a research director at CNRS, former scientist at EPFL and IBM Research, and he is also a scientific advisor for a few software companies. His research interests include data-centric programming, and in particular, knowledge extraction from graphs. This talk will present an overview of some open challenges in information extraction from graphs, in particular with recursive queries that navigate in graphs. And the second part will introduce the test query tool, which aims at exposing the graph structure of the test blockchain and at facilitating its exploration. So Pierre, whenever you want, over to you. Okay, thank you, Danny, for this uh, introduction. Uh, so let me share my screen in full screen mode. Uh, so hello, so I'm going to talk about um, the challenges of extracting information from graphs and uh, I'll also present the test query tool. So today we are witnessing uh, unprecedented growth in uh, interconnected uh, data and big graphs become increasingly widespread so we can find them in several areas including uh, decentralized finance as we are going to see. Uh, so big graphs are basically linked data structure, very, very large linked data structures of nodes and edges, which are especially interesting for extracting information um, because they uh, notably present a high level view of data, uh, a view which can be materialized or not. And because basically they make it possible to extract new information or even to infer new knowledge. Uh, in the sense that they open the door to high-level queries and in particular those that exploit uh, links as we are going to see. Uh, so there are many research challenges uh, remaining with big graphs uh, at the moment uh, due to several factors and among those factors size plays an important role uh, because we can find very large scale graphs uh, in several areas including uh, semantic web for instance where we can find knowledge graphs uh, with millions of nodes and edges and for instance the tezos blockchain um, has more than 12 millions of uh, transactions uh, as of uh, to today uh, between uh, more than 1 million of uh, addresses and this is a quite different uh, kind of, uh, of graph as we are going to see, uh, which uh, raises a lot of uh, different challenges as well. Um, one other factor is dynamicity because some graphs may evolve very fast. So for instance, it's uh, very common to see at least uh, 100 new transactions per minute on the Tezos blockchain. Um, and finally, uh, the fact that those uh, graphs uh, can have um, a rich data model where edges and vertices can be annotated with more or less complex information uh, also plays a crucial role uh, and, and raise many challenges, in particular in terms of data representation. So how uh, should we represent those graphs so that uh, uh, querying them uh, becomes uh, efficient? How to visualize them or rather how to visualize portions of them because they are so big that we are um, often interested in only uh, relevant portions of them. Um, and last but not least, uh, one of the most important challenge is about query languages with uh, the traditional um, trade-off between expressive power uh, of the query languages and efficient efficiency to um, effectively uh, retrieve uh, the results for query answering. Uh, so there are basically two uh, graph data models, knowledge graphs and property graphs. Uh, so knowledge graphs have been made very popular by the resource description uh, framework format, the RDF format, uh, which has been standardized by the World Wide Web Consortium in charge of uh, standardizing um, uh, web technologies. Um, so knowledge graphs provide a very specific data model uh, in, in such a knowledge graph, uh, we consider a set of triples. So a graph is seen as a set of triples uh, where one triple, SPO, basically connects a subject, which is a vert uh, vertex S, to another vertex O, which is called the object. And the connection uh, through an edge is labeled by exactly one 
predicate, one logical predicate, P. Um, so this very specific data model uh, offers several advantages. Uh, first of all, it comes with a uh, query language, which is standardized, uh, which is called Sparkle, and which comes with a uh, rather well-defined formal semantics. And knowledge graphs also come with languages for defining and exploiting graph types, uh, which basically opens the door to plenty of interesting resulting features, like the use of ontologies, knowledge completion, and even logical dedu ded deduction to, to some extent. I would also say that uh, those uh, knowledge graphs, that they're very specific data model, uh, basically provide a good set of hypotheses for developing a lot of optimizations, uh, in particular data partitioning based on predicates, on logical predicates. Um, however, they, they, they have also limitations, and one of them is the annotations for the edges. So what if we want more sophisticated annotations uh, for an edge? So typically, uh, if we consider uh, transactions between addresses, uh, most probably we would like to equip the, um, uh, the edge representing the transaction with additional information, such as an amount, a date, etc. Um, so property graphs are a much more general graph data model in which both edges and nodes can carry a list of key value pairs. So this is a much more uh, general uh, data model. Uh, so we call uh, this uh, a list of properties and property values. And they are indeed much more appropriate for several applications, including blockchain data, as we are going to see. Uh, however, uh, there is uh, currently no standard, so no type definition language, for instance. And I would say that query languages are still in infancy at the moment, in the sense that their standardization is still in very early stage. Uh, for a good reason, is that, that theory is still partly under development. Uh, so formal semantics is being developed for fragments of, of uh, query languages, for those um, property graphs. And basically, possible query optimizations are still to be better understood and better developed. Um, so what is so difficult with queries that exploit uh, the linked data structure? Uh, let's consider a simple example consisting of uh, one query here, uh, n red green star t. So this query basically navigates in a graph starting from a given node n to retrieve all the candidate nodes t that can be reached uh, along a given path consisting of, uh, of uh, a first step by red edges followed by zero or more uh, steps of navigation by green edges. Okay, uh, so for instance, here uh, if we consider uh, a graph, um, on which uh, we may want to evaluate this query and, and retrieve all uh, the candidate T nodes that can be reached in this manner. Uh, so there are several ways, several different ways to evaluate and to actually execute, to retrieve all the, the, the candidate nodes uh, that can be reached in this manner. So good programmers uh, may realize quickly that here on this particular graph, since we have only one node N, uh, then it's probably a good idea to start from this node N, first navigate through red edges, and then navigate progressively to all, uh, through all possible green uh, edges to progressively collect all the results and finally answer uh, the, the query. Uh, so some of the observations on, on, this, uh, on this example. Uh, so here, by doing... Uh, by evaluating this query in this manner, uh, we actually retrieve the results without computing the full relation green star, which means that we here we don't need to uh, compute the set of pairs of nodes which are related by a green path, okay? Which is, by the way, a good idea, because if you look carefully in this graph, uh, green paths are quite long, okay? So computing green star might be very costly. And in fact, what happens is that um, it might be not only very costly, but it might even be unfeasible on certain graphs. 
So more generally, what happens is that the evaluation strategy, so in the literature we say the query execution plan, can have a huge impact uh, on the performance for retrieving results. And when I say huge impact, I mean that uh, the time needed for actually computing the results can vary uh, for the same query, depending on the, the query execution plan that we choose uh, between seconds uh, and days, for instance. Um, query answering might even be uh, feasible or not, even for graphs of moderate size, depending on the chosen query execution plan. Uh, so it's therefore crucial to, to, to choose a good execution plan for a given uh, query like this. So other examples of, uh, of queries that exploit uh, links in the data structure. Um, so for instance, the query can contain more than one variable, which, which means here, for instance, we are interested in selecting all the pairs of nodes that are connected uh, by a given regular expression over edges in the graph. Uh, queries may also contain more general forms of navigation, so more general uh, regular expressions over edge labels, for instance, um, or even several regressions, in which case uh, it's less trivial to determine which exploration should start first, for instance. So should we start with uh, red star, with green star, or maybe both? Uh, it's not trivial, okay? Uh, and it's also not trivial in the sense that for very large graphs with millions of nodes, many of such queries uh, still remain unfeasible at the moment. Uh, so the fundamental problem that we have here, independently from the size of the graph, is the following. So given a graph and a query, how to generate an efficient evaluation plan for the query, including its recursive subparts? Um, so there are plenty of, of, um, of uh, query language fragments for expressing recursive subparts, like uh, regular path queries or union of conjunctive regular path queries. So we'll come back on, on this later. So the, the previous examples that I presented are regular path queries examples. Um, so what's the state of the theory uh, for, for this, uh, this problem? Um, so here is um, a brief and partial recap of the theory. Uh, so we can say that everything started in 1970 with the introduction of codes relational algebra that, as you know, established the domain of databases, which is today a multi-billion dollars market. And at the time, one of the key idea was to separate the query language, so the high-level query language, SQL at the time, from the optimizer backend, from the relational algebra. Uh, so at the time, it was a question of tables, rational tables, no graph, um, and there was no recursion in the original um, rational uh, algebra. Uh, so, so later, in the 80s and 90s, there were attempts at extending rational algebra with recursion, but with moderate success, uh, in the sense that uh, there were rather limited forms of uh, recursion. Uh, Nevertheless, the, there was a lot of interesting research on the data log side, which is rather a logical programming view, uh, rather logical than algebraic, but very related uh, at, at that moment. And then in 1999, recursion was introduced in the SQL language. So since that moment, SQL supo actually supports recursive queries, but recursion has been uh, seen as an optimization barrier for most optimizers uh, since then. Uh, so in the uh, beginning of the 2000 uh, and maybe until 2015 or even later, there was a boom of NoSQL research, uh, in particular for linked data structures such as trees, uh, where the key idea was to try to preserve the native data structure, uh, trying not to split uh, it into tables uh, to try to avoid expensive joints afterwards. Uh, so this worked quite well for trees in particular. Um, uh, yeah. uh, and in late 2010, there was plenty of, uh, there were plenty of graph database systems that, that appeared, many of them with uh, poor or no support at all for recursion. 
but some supported recursion uh, and were increasingly inspired by our research on data log or, or, or SQL. And finally, very recently, uh, so a few months ago, last year, uh, rational algebra was extended with a more, much more general form of recursion, uh, which is, by the way, inspired from the research on tree logics uh, in the meantime, uh, with an application to, to graphs. So I, here, I think it's uh, quite interesting to realize that the mainstream research on those aspects progressively went uh, from SQL to NoSQL, and then not only SQL, and then finally, new SQL. Um, so I'd like to give you uh, an overview of some of the most recent results in this area, uh, because I think that they can contribute to, to, to change the game in this, uh, in this area. Um, so here is the extended relational algebra, uh, also called mu array, which was uh, published last year at SIGMOD in 2020. Uh, so here, uh, you, you can uh, you probably recognize some construct that you, you've uh, you've seen uh, already in Codes relational algebra. Uh, so this is basically um, the main constructs of the of the algebra. So the relation variable, which basically denotes a, a simple table, uh, a constant, which is just a tuple uh, of mappings, where in each mapping you associate uh, a column name you associate a value to a column name, so to each column name corresponds a value. Um, and then selection, where you can filter a given algebraic term. Uh, you have also the classical column renaming operator, which basically renames the column A into column B in a given term. Uh, and then the anti-projection, which is just the column dropping operator. So in, in the original version of the uh, Cotts relational algebra, th there was the projection operator. Uh, so here, the only difference is that instead of specifying the columns that you want to keep, you just specify the column that you want to remove, basically. But this is the same uh, idea. Just for the sake of simplicity for the rest of the presentation, we consider the anti-projection here. Um, then we have a column duplication operator, which basically duplicates some column A into a new fresh uh, column B, and then a classical form of union and the, the join, natural join operator, which basically joins um, on all the common columns uh, of the two subterms, phi1 and phi2. And then the, the purpose of the extension here uh, is the fixed point uh, operator is to, to support, to offer support for recursion. Uh, so basically, to extend all the original ideas of the Codes relational algebra to um, support recursive queries. Uh, so how does it work uh, for, and how does it apply uh, for graph queries? Um, so typically, in the graph, when we want to, um, uh, starting from a given node, uh, source node, when we want to express uh, and to select a target node, uh, by navigating through a given path. Uh, let's consider, for instance, the very simple path consisting of two steps, A followed by B. This basically means that starting from the source node and by doing a first navigation step by an edge labeled with A, we can reach some node, let's say M, for instance, and then by another navigation step by uh, some edge labeled with B, we can finally reach um, the target node. And this is exactly uh, this idea that we use for translating uh, this into the algebra. Okay, so for translating uh, a navigation A slash B in the algebra, we first translate A, okay, then we translate B, and then we make sure that the target node of A is renamed as M, the source node of uh, B is renamed as M, so that we can perform a join and ensure that this uh, M node is common. So is both the target and the source. It both, is both the target uh, of A and the source of B. And once this is done, we can just get rid of the column M. We don't need it anymore uh, so that we um, fall back on our feet having an algebraic term that links a source to a target node. So this is how we can translate uh, a navigation A slash B how we can represent it as an algebraic term. So what happens with recursion? 
Um, so when we consider A star, so the reflexive transitive closure of the relation A, uh, this basically means either the empty path, so we stay in place, or the path of one or more uh, edges labeled with A. So a path of uh, one or more edges labeled with A is also uh, named A plus. So this is just the transitive closure of the relation A. And it's itself, it can be expressed as uh, A star followed by um, another navigation step by A. Uh, so in other terms, this means that the translation of A star is just the empty path or itself followed by another a navigation step by A. And this is exactly where the fixed point operator is interesting because it allows to explicitly introduce uh, a fresh new variable X and bind it to a term in which X appears. So here, basically, we explicitly denote recursion in algebraic, um, algebraically. Okay, uh, so if we replace x slash a by the previous uh, translation that, that I've shown uh, and the empty path by its definition, which can be uh, the set of all nodes where I basically just duplicate target nodes into source nodes, then I get um, an algebraic term that is uh, that expresses what uh, a star is. Okay. Uh, so the interest of having these new fixed point operators is that uh, we can uh, design new rewrite rules, in other terms, new algebraic transformations of uh, fixed points of, of recursive terms uh, that um, preserve and extend the, all the original ideas of the code's relational algebra. So for instance, we may want to push filters uh, that are around a given recursion. So whenever this is possible, we may want to push the filter inside the recursion, so has to filter um, as close as possible to the source in order to reduce the size of intermediate results and uh, to speed up the computation of uh, the, recursion, the recursion, basically. Okay. Um, so obviously, this is not always possible. Okay. We have to satisfy um, conditions for this kind of transformation to, to apply safely in order to preserve the semantics, because obviously we want to, um, to compute equivalent representations, equivalent terms, but we don't want to break the semantics, obviously. Um, so same idea, we want to push joins whenever this is possible. So for instance, if you have a, a, a term that is joined with a recursive term, um, sometimes it can be transformed into a, a recursion where the join is pushed inside. So same idea with projections uh, or anti-projections that can be pushed through uh, the, 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 the recursion. And we uh, can also uh, merge uh, recursive terms uh, whenever this is possible. So for instance, whenever we have um, a join of two recursive terms under certain circumstances, this can be merged into a single recursion uh, which is slightly uh, more sophisticated, but which has um, uh, a single uh, recursive uh, operator. Uh, so obviously, all those rules uh, we want them to be semantics. Uh, we, we want them to preserve the semantics. And um, so here, for the sake of um, of clarity, I did not present the, all the detailed conditions so that. Uh, uh, those rules can apply safely without breaking the semantics. Um, but those, uh, those conditions that must be satisfied uh, are decidable. They, they have been proved decidable, so we can do that uh, automatically. Uh, so if we come back to our simple example, uh, where we wanted to uh, select all the nodes that, can, that could be reached by a given uh, red and green path from a given node n, um, we can translate this query uh, in an algebraic, uh, into an algebraic term. Uh, and here, for instance, we can clearly see the, that um, green star is translated uh, as a fixed point term in which we start from this base case here, and then we apply a recursive term 
uh, we apply the, the, the recursive part of the, of the term uh, that basically navigates repeatedly um, by green edges on, on the right of X, okay? Uh, and then, uh, obviously, we also need to uh, to translate the rest, meaning that we na navigate by red and also filter. And by the systematic application of the algebraic transformation rules that I just introduced, we can uh, progressively generate equivalent algebraic terms and reach the optimal form that um, that we are interested in uh, evaluating. Okay, so here we we can see that the regression uh, starts only from um, the um, already filtered uh, and uh, anti-projected um, uh, subterm. Okay, uh, so. So th this is for the application of uh, uh, of the, the simple rules that basically well simple that 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 push uh, filters and uh, and joints inside uh, recursions, uh, but we can also merge fixed points um, and um, which is slightly more involved, but still the intuition is uh, I think is easy to get. So uh, for instance, if we consider a query that uh, is of the form x red plus green plus y, for instance, um, so where the plus is just the transitive closure, meaning that we want to extract from the graph pairs of nodes that are connected by um, a path consisting of one or more uh, red edges and then one or more uh, uh, green uh, edges. Then by the systematic application of, uh, of those algebraic rules, we will uh, generate equivalent plans. So in particular, uh, the logical evaluation plan that unfolds green plus from right to left, or the plan that rather starts from the red plus recursion and tries to unfold it from left to right, or the other direction as well. And at some point, uh, we... Um, uh, can generate the merge fixed point uh, equivalent term, which uh, basically will start from places in the graph where uh, we have a red followed by green navigation, which is possible. And then we'll, uh, so this is the base case of the recursion. So we start from red green, and then we will repeatedly hop on the left by red star and repeatedly hop on the right by green star which you can see here because here we are adding um, red uh, navigations on the left of the recursive variable and here green uh, uh, navigations on the right of the recursive variable um, so basically instead of uh, of uh, choosing uh, one di direction basically here we start um, from the red green pattern and and then uh, repeatedly go uh, on both sides uh, at the same time somehow uh, so more generally what happens is that we consider uh, graph queries uh, we translate them into um, the algebraic representation uh, so given a, a graph query it is first translated into a given algebraic term and then uh, by applying uh, the algebraic transformation rules, we basically populate a plan of equivalent, of, um, we, sorry, we populate a space of equivalent plans for the query. Uh, so by applying all the, all the rules, we will um, generate a potentially very large number of, uh, of equivalent algebraic terms, uh, algebraic plans, logical plans, and uh, what is interesting to realize is that uh, thanks to the new rules that deal with the fixed point operator, we can uh, generate new plans that were beyond reach uh, with earlier approaches. Okay, uh, so this is typically the case for plans with merged fixed points, uh, which were not computable uh, before. So in other terms, um, this algebra and those uh, new rewrite rules allows us to um, generate new ways of computing the results of uh, some recursive queries, okay? new ways of evaluating uh, recursive queries. And using um, a cost estimation, uh, so heuristics based on uh, statistics on the, on the graph, on the, on the data, we will then pick one of those generated plan, uh, the one that is estimated um, 
the most efficient to evaluate and send it to the, to the backend for evaluation. Um, and this is, this is how, how it works. Uh, so in practice, this approach can be implemented on top of relational uh, database management systems like PostgreSQL, for instance. And um, it allows one to, to obtain performance gains, uh, which are very significant uh, for queries on knowledge graphs. Okay, uh, so performance gains are sometimes of orders of magnitude. Uh, or even feasibility for some queries that were uh, unfeasible uh, b before. So here is an extract of um, of uh, some experimental results on uh, on a knowledge graph um, where the approach has been implemented on top of uh, PostgreSQL uh, and which is compared to other uh, specialized systems. Uh, graph database uh, management systems like Neo4j or uh, the logic box uh, engine. Um, and we, so here the, the time scale is the, uh, is logarithmic. Um, and uh, we can see that uh, clearly some uh, plans that are computed uh, are very relevant in, in practice. So here those uh, drastic gains uh, are mainly due to the combination of those new plans, those new um, query evaluation plans, and data partitioning. Uh, because here, since we operate on knowledge graphs, we can use um, data partitioning based on the labeled predicates. So you remember in knowledge graph, there is only uh, one um, label on, on the edges and we can leverage that uh, that hypothesis to, to, to develop uh, interesting data partitioning uh, optimizations. So the combination of the two um, provides a significant gain. Um, so today this is still a domain uh, where um, research is ongoing and is very uh, active at the moment. Um, so some perspective, um, some research perspectives uh, at the moment uh, are to extend such kind of results to support not only knowledge graphs, but also large scale property graphs uh, with the high level query languages and appropriate extensions. Another goal is to try to, to do that while operating uh, almost seamlessly and efficiently for sure on top of uh, various backends, uh, which can be centralized database management systems like PostgreSQL or others, or even on distributed uh, platforms. Um, so this is still an area and a very active research from both uh, the programming language side and also the database side. Um, so in this context, I'd like to uh, present uh, the test query project uh, which basically started uh, from uh, the initial idea, uh, somewhat crazy idea, to evaluate recursive, to try to evaluate recursive queries on the graph of the Tezos blockchain. Uh, so what is the, the, the graph of the Tezos blockchain? Uh, so to the retained structure is a property graph uh, where nodes are addresses, which can be either accounts or contracts. Uh, linked by directed edges, which represent transactions uh, annotated with an amount and uh, a date, for instance. Um, so at the moment, the, the size of the graph um, is uh, very significant. Uh, it has uh, um, uh, yeah, around 12 million of, uh, of edges, linking more than 1.2 million of, uh, of uh, addresses. And here, the fact that the, this is not a knowledge graph, this is a rather a property graph, uh, the fact that we, we don't have logical uh, predicates, we, have, we don't have uh, predicate labels to, to, to leverage on, on data partitioning techniques. So it's important to, to, to notice that because it adds considerably to the, to, uh, to the difficulty of uh, evaluating recursive queries. Um, so one result of this project is the test query tool, uh, which is an implementation that uh, enables to expose the graph structure of the Tezos blockchain and to facilitate its exploration through the use of uh, high-level queries and to browse it with a user interface. 
so the, the implementation is open source and available on GitLab. And there is also a demo website, which we are going to see afterwards. Um, and this tool basically makes it possible to observe transaction patterns, um, like discovering uh, transaction clusters, meaning uh, groups um, of uh, transactions between the same groups of uh, accounts, for instance, or to examine sequences of uh, transactions, uh, either direct or indirect sequences of transactions between uh, accounts and, uh, and contracts, for instance. Um, so the architecture of this, uh, this tool is a set of components uh, where the main component is the server component, which is uh, an HTTP server that basically receives high-level queries as input and computes them by issuing more basic, by compiling them into more basic um, queries uh, asked against the blockchain indexed in the database and return the result. Um, so the second most important component is the web UI component, which is the user interface basically uh, of the tool, which is a set of JavaScript and HTML pages. So mostly uh, dynamic uh, JavaScript uh, that is written uh, as uh, extensions of uh, existing open source libraries, uh, such as d3.js in particular and uh, which enables the control of the display of the portions of the interest uh, of the graph. Um, and the database component is the PostgreSQL instance that contains uh, the indexed blockchain. Uh, and finally, there is a sync component which is in charge of performing the synchronization of the database uh, reusing the open source TZKT uh, in order to keep the database up to date with the latest transaction. Uh, so all those components run in parallel and interact between each other uh, in the sense that the web, uh, the user interface obviously relies on the server, which in turn uses the database, which is updated, uh, keep up, kept up to date by the, by the thing. Uh, so this tool offers new possibility. Uh, in particular, it um, allows one to browse the graph of the latest transactions. Uh, it allows one to explore how the biggest transactions uh, over a given period of time are connected. And also to search whether two addresses are connected by a sequence uh, of indirect transactions, possibly involving contracts. So this feature has to be used with filters, obviously, to slash as much as possible the combinatorics. Um, and um, also, it allows one to explore the blockchain from a given account using a progressive semi-automatic recursive uh, expansion of the graph, starting from the from the given initial account. Um, so, in each uh, kind of exploration, uh, there is a common set of facilities uh, which allow the user to uh, select, drag, or zoom subparts of the blockchain graph, or to regroup singles, which means accounts that are um, only connected to, to others by a single transaction, um, or to select arbitrary subsets of accounts that can be merged, splitted, or removed. Uh, and at any moment, uh, the user can uh, click on the backbone um, to observe uh, the backbone structure uh, of, the, of, the, of the graph how the transactions are uh, connected. Uh, and each kind of exploration also comes with its uh, specific uh, facilities, like a range of dates, for instance, for further filtering the portions of, uh, of the graphs of, of, uh, of interest, um, or an expansion ratio for controlling how uh, it should be um, progressively expanded, starting from a given account. So all of those uh, features are controlled using the, the controls on the main menu bar, uh, which is shown here. This is an extract of, uh, of a screenshot of the tool, and that are basically used to generate automatically uh, the corresponding queries. Uh, so here are uh, some screenshots, of uh, some sample screenshots of the tool in use. Uh, for, for instance, identifying sequences of transactions that connect two account clusters, 
here on the left. So we can see a first uh, account cluster and a second one here. And here the, the user um, clicks on the intermediate uh, accounts here to have more information on, on, those, uh, on those accounts. And on, on the right here, uh, the user is exploring the, the backbone structure of uh, Tezos Graph, for instance. Um, so here, again, this is another screenshot of the tool uh, that shows how the biggest Tezos transactions ever made are connected uh, or not between each other. So we can see that there are uh, se several, um, uh, let's say, islands uh, of, of transactions. And some of them are, are, uh, are quite long uh, sequences. For instance, if you look at this long sequence here, um, that links um, uh, that links uh, s several uh, contracts. Uh, so, so those are basically Coinbase delegators, okay, uh, that are linked by a sequence of um, of transactions, for instance. Um, also, the tool allows to um, to run some uh, recursive query to search for for potentially indirect transactions. Uh, so a sample such query uh, would be the following. So we, the user wants to check whether some address, let's say X, is connected to another address, Y, for instance, and Y might be considered suspicious, for instance, um, by, let's say, four hops of transactions with large amounts. So using the tool, um, so in the, in the hosted mode, uh, this can be achieved by um, either um, controls on the user uh, interface where you you enter uh, the two um, uh, the two uh, addresses of interest uh, and control all the other parameters to generate the, the query for you automatically or even by uh, passing parameters directly uh, on the URL uh, of the appropriate page uh, so for instance here um, we use several attributes to pass for instance the, the first here this is the address of um, of, uh, of a contract here. So this would be a variable X, for instance. This is the source. This is the target uh, here. This is a smart contract, for instance. And then um, the depth, uh, so the, the maximum length, uh, um, uh, so counting, uh, counting uh, all uh, accounts linked by the transactions and uh, a minimum amount, for instance. And um, yes, if I, for instance, if I click on the um, on the URL, then uh, I get the um, the uh, immediately the sequence, or almost immediately the sequence of uh, of uh, transactions um, in in question. Um, so obviously, you, you have to to, to use uh, filters. Um, uh, to uh, if you want to to query um, the, the the blockchain uh, uh, efficiently, um, another feature of the tool is the exploration from a given account. So here, instead of uh, asking whether two given addresses might be connected by a sequence of uh, direct or indirect transactions, the idea is that uh, you you may uh, know only one account to start with, and then would like to discover progressively uh, what uh, are the other uh, accounts that are, or contracts that are uh, that can be reached uh, starting from from this initial account. Uh, so here again, the the, uh, the the tool comes with specific facilities to to define how uh, the the graph uh, the neighborhood of um, of the starting node should be expanded, okay? In particular with a shrinking ratio, which controls how many transactions should be explored at each level, okay? Um, so still, this is another screenshot of the tool uh, showing um, that, uh, yes, that, that we can also explore. Um, the, so here, uh, we explored from a given account, which is the Ikenunk uh, Minter uh, for minting NFTs on, on Tezos. Uh, so this is, this is how it, it looked like uh, uh, a few uh, days um, ago. Um, so some concluding uh, remarks. 
Um, so this tool exposes the graph structure of the Tezos blockchain, uh, allows to evaluate some recursive queries uh, on the blockchain with a UI to present the, the results. Uh, so there is a demo website uh, and an open source implementation uh, on, on GitLab. And so that there are probably many perspectives for improvements or even maybe new applications. Um, the idea uh, is, is the same towards uh, a, li a little bit more observability for uh, the, the Tezos uh, blockchain. Uh, so thank you very much. And I would be happy to answer uh, questions if uh, if. Uh, so any. thank you, Pierre. Uh, that was very interesting. So I wanted to ask you a question just, but you you just answered on the slide thirty two, which was about uh, uh, a use case of uh, of the test query tool, uh, which is quite interesting. So you're not uh, tracking indirect transactions, so to see if two addresses are connected. So that's a use case quite uh, quite interesting when uh, when you want to see if. Uh, if I don't know if you've got one of your in the in the business, for instance, if you if you want to see if your client deal with you know some uh, some uh, some suspicious parties, so that's quite interesting to have this kind of tool. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question from uh, Jan on the slide nineteen. So I think it's when you do the transformation. Nineteen on the slide nineteen. So he's asking with respect to measure is that an optimal form so, so he asked uh, with sorry? respect to which measure is that question. an optimal form ah okay uh, yeah that's a very good question <laughs> So here, for, for this uh, particular case, uh, yes, it happens that uh, this is the, the best, uh, uh, the, the optimal form because we we measured um, we we measure it um, um, we measure the the time spent in evaluating uh, the query after having sent this uh, logical plan to the to the backend, so to PostgreSQL, for instance. Okay, so you can send, so you can basically compile. Uh, each of those algebraic terms uh, in terms of uh, SQL query and send each of them uh, f to PostgreSQL for evaluation. So PostgreSQL will uh, basically consider recursion as an optimization barrier. So you won't be able to, to, to do this uh, alone. So if you give it uh, one of the first um, a few queries, you probably uh, don't get um, uh, the, the best performance. Whereas here in that particular case, uh, we can show uh, that this one uh, is the best. Uh, but yes, the measure, so for instance, on my other slide, uh, let me, yeah. So here, typically, uh, so this is a good question. So w what kind of measure can we use to validate experimentally uh, the results? Uh, so an answer, one possible answer is the time spent in evaluating uh, the, the, the queries. So here, for instance, you have the time spent uh, whenever uh, the, 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 pl um, the plan computed by mu array is selected, so in orange, uh, whereas uh, the time uh, spent in, in blue by PostgreSQL is, is much, um, much more important. Um, and I think that there is probably another dimension in the question, um, obviously, whenever we need to choose, so uh, on slide 19, I think it's, it, it might look uh, quite obvious that, that this one, the last one, uh, is, um, is the most efficient. Uh, but, well, I, I chose a simple, well, I tried to, to show a simple example where um, it's easy to convince ourselves that this is the, the most efficient way to do. To do. Uh, but obviously, in general, we might have very complicated terms that represent very complicated uh, sequences of uh, or arrangement of sequences of computations, and it, it might be much more difficult to determine which one is the best. And therefore, at some point, we have to rely on a cost estimation that uses uh, that is based on, on the heuristics. So these heuristics. Uh, is based on statistics of the data, uh, which try to summarize the topology of the graph, let's say. So how many um, um, 
So we use, uh, for instance, histograms. Uh, PostgreSQL uses histograms to, to try to have an idea of which relations are um, larger, which relations are larger than, than, than the others. Uh, and then those statistics on the data are propagated using a cost estimation function uh, that goes through each of the operation in a given term, uh, which means if we go back to the uh, to, the, to the syntax of the algebra. For each of those terms, we will have a cost estimation function uh, that will take uh, estimated um, cardinalities and that will all put uh, another estimated uh, cardinality after the application of the operation. Uh, so not only a cardinality, but also the, the time cost that uh, is estimated. So is it, uh, is, is it clearer? So there is a delay of 10 of 10 seconds so i think here yeah. um so in the meantime i'm going to ask another question from jan so i know that there have been work recently about incrementers and the data log queries in the sense that a query output can be essentially updated when the database is updated would it be possible to incrementalize graph queries to visualize the results updated in real time when the chain creates new blocks. That's a very interesting question. Okay. Um, possibly. Okay. So I'm not an expert of those uh, of those uh, incremental uh, results. So I uh, on the data log side. So I know some uh, some works on incrementalization by some colleagues at EPFL. Um, but uh, it, yeah, it's rather on um, matrix computations. But uh, but he, yes, I guess that this is an interesting perspective of research. I'm sure that uh, this is something worth to to, to investigate. Okay. So, <laughs> I, I don't see why it. I mean, yeah, probably. I mean, we can we can imagine plenty of data structures and to to do this incrementalization. Yeah, I think that yeah. <laughs> this should be interesting. So to see. Jan asked me if I don't like his first question. So there was there has a, a there, there has been another there was another question just before. So uh, I don't know if you can see it in the chat. <laughs> okay. Uh, so first question. Ah, uh, okay. Let me let me uh, have a look at the chat. So it's in uh, scene. So it's uh, could be also defined. I don't remember where you can see this one. So in scene. Uh, um, so in the first at the top. Ah, okay. So at the top. So uh, can we also oh, yes. there are a lot of questions. Nice. A TRS store as, well. as mu empty path. Could we, uh, okay, so could we also define the translation of uh, a star as mu x equals empty path or a slash x? Uh, yes. Yes. So, uh, so just to to come back to the the given slide, just to clarify, uh, where is? Um, so, yeah. Um, so basically, so it's. Uh, um, yeah. So, so this is actually a very good question. Uh, okay. So it's true that here on this slide, I presented um, one possible translation of uh, a star, where the, the x is appended on the left, and um, uh, Jan Regis, yeah, Jan uh, is, is is wondering whether, but how come you you put it uh, on the left and not on the right? Yes, I could have put it on the right. This is totally correct. In which case, this is also interesting because here what happens is that I will um, this recursion, as shown on the slide, will had um, recursive navigation on on the right. So this corresponds to a navigation from left to right because each time I go through the recursive case, I I'm joining basically on the right through an A uh, labeled age, okay? Whereas if I do the opposite, so if I put X uh, on the right, I would navigate uh, to the left. So yes, those two translations are uh, interesting uh, because a priori we don't know um, 
uh, where to start. I mean, it depends on the shape of, of the graph, and this is something that is also uh, taken in charge by the cost uh, estimator afterwards. So in the implementation, what we do actually is that we consider both translations, and we keep track of them both because they can generate um, different um, subspaces of plants. And we don't know a priori which in which one of the two plants the best, the most efficient estimated term will reside. So yes, it's very important to consider both. Okay. So yeah, there is uh, another question from him. Um, yeah. So there is a lot of work about efficient representation of graphs to compress very large graph in memory for very specific queries. I guess you cannot use that kind of ad hoc implementation choice because you want a very expressive query language. Do you have an idea of the slowdown that you pay in action for this generality? Um, yeah, so basically we did some experiments with um, with um, uh, graph summarization techniques. Um, um, yeah, but so, okay, so this is indeed a very expensive, um, um, yeah, for sure, we have to, to do, uh, to make a balance between either we pay at query evaluation time or we pay um, in terms of pre-processing uh, to compute this graph uh, summarization. And the experiments we've been doing uh, were mostly for trying to have better statistics, better um, uh, to improve our cost estimation functions with uh, very recent graph summarization techniques. But unfortunately, it's very, very, it might be very expensive to compute those graph uh, summarization, and sometimes it is not mm, worthwhile at, at query evaluation time. So you can see the, the dilemma or the, um, the trade off in both directions. Yeah. I don't have a precise, uh, precise, um, precise numbers uh, in mind to, to comment on this, but yeah, this is a, a choice that uh, so has to be made. So I think I have to point. wrap up now uh, because it's time. I think uh, so. Thanks, uh, thanks Pierre for, for the presentation, uh, and thanks also everyone to attend here. Uh, I think the next uh, Nomadic Labs research uh, seminar is going to be next week, so we hope that we're going to see you too. So thanks everyone. Bye.